welcome. Uh, my name is Lindsay Lear. I'm managing director of PCMI, uh, and we're thrilled to have you today. Um, we run these coffee chats once a month as a space for our industry to come together, discuss trends in the payments industry, mostly focusing on Latin America, but increasingly incorporating trends that are taking place around the world. Um, and what we do in these chats is uh, chat about a salient trend that's impacting all of us uh, with a guest speaker. And we really encourage this to be an open forum. It's not a webinar. Uh, we do have some presentation slides to share with you today, but we really encourage open dialogue, sharing questions, and uh, we really want to um, include you all as much as possible in, in, the, in the talk today. So if we go ahead, just a couple of guidelines to make sure we have a smooth session. Please keep in mind we're recording this. Um, these do get uploaded to our YouTube channel and are available for, for viewing for those who missed today's chat. Um, there's also, as, as I mentioned, this is an open forum. So you might have competitors, investors, journalists in the room. So just, you know, when um, mind your comments as you would in any in-person speaking event. Okay, um, again, we want you to share. So there's a couple of ways to do that. You can raise your hand on the screen. You can put a, a comment in the chat. You can raise your hand in the chat. You can also just jump in. Um, please be mindful and respectful of the flow of the conversation. We don't want any one person dominating. However, uh, we do want you to feel at liberty and empowered to jump in on, on the conversation. All right, so uh, with that being said, uh, let's go ahead. And um, I'm really excited about today's topic, okay? The last couple uh, coffee chats of the year, we were talking about cross-border payments, ISO 222, um, kind of kind of global trends and how they're impacting Latin America. Um, and today, we're, today we're, we're, we're switching gears and we're zooming into a very particular topic in a very particular market. And that is payment aggregators in the Mexican market. And why is this? I'm, I'm, so, I'm so thrilled and grateful to have Daniel Martinez, who represents both CLIP and also ASAMEP, which is the Association of Aggregators in Mexico. So before I go on, I just want to welcome Daniel. Thank you for joining us, Daniel. If you could just give us a quick intro and then we'll, we'll continue on. Hi, Lindsay. Thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here and joining you guys. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm a director of external affairs at CLIP. But I also wear a hat of uh, coordinating the public policy uh, group uh, at ASAMEP, which, as you said, is the, the Payment Aggregator Association. So a lot of interactions with uh, regulators, uh, with industry partners, uh, of course, with the Banking Association uh, and other key players in the, in the payment ecosystem here in Mexico as a whole. So very excited to share the, the experience that I have with you guys and to engage with you. Fantastic. So, um, you know, the reason that I am so excited about this topic is because uh, Mexico is the country that we at PCMI get the most questions about. All right. Mexico is a large market, um, you know, far larger in population than several of its neighboring Latin American countries. Uh, number two in the region, close to the U.S. market. There's has so many advantages, has a lot going for it. And yet, is behind when it comes to penetration of digital payments. And this is a question that really, even in the last 18 months, has become more urgent to answer. We've been receiving this question from almost everyone, from every corner of the industry. I mean, we know that it's a complex question and we certainly don't intend to answer it fully today, but I think Daniela is gonna share with us some very interesting insights. Um, and we wanna hear from all of you on this question. So, um, if we go ahead, I think uh, we're going to start off just, um, Daniel has some great just context providing information and then also talking a little bit ab about the regulatory um, position, uh, position of regulators at the moment on this question right now. So I'm going to pause, turn it over to Daniel. Uh, I'm going to jump in with questions, Daniel, as we go, and I know the group will as well. So please take it away. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, and thanks so much, for, so much for the invitation and the opportunity. Uh, I really like to, any opportunity that I get to speak about the role that payment aggregators have played in Mexico, uh, particularly in the last decade, uh, just because of the size of the opportunity that we still face uh, before us. Uh, but so much of the history that has been done in the past decade is, is often not told uh, and worth a look. So I hope to illustrate some of, of what has been going on in the past decade here in Mexico. Um, uh, as you will see, the story of how payment aggregators in Mexico uh, since 2014 uh, have streamlined transactions, uh, enabled businesses to accept diverse payment methods, 
uh, and fac facilitate in many ways financial inclusion uh, for merchants and consumers. Uh, but I'm also going to speak about uh, some of the, of the challenges that aggregators still face, uh, aggregators and the card payment network as a whole uh, in the country. So uh, can we do the next slide, please? So uh, what are payment aggregators? I, I know this audience is fairly well read uh, on this, so I, I'll be quick about it. So payment aggregators are, are, are basically the backbone of uh, modern commerce, uh, seamlessly connecting merchants uh, with a plethora of payment uh, uh, options and financial institutions. Um, by consolidating various method payments into one unified system, they simplify the checkout process and democratize access to payment uh, processing and empowering small businesses to compete with larger uh, merchants, larger companies or corporations. So, um, however, the landscape of payment aggregators, of course, differs from country to country, um, influenced by regulatory frameworks, uh, market dynamics, um, consumer behaviors, competitions, and others. Uh, and in some regions, payment aggregators focus on uh, integrating local payment methods, uh, being able to accept every payment in one, uh, one point of sale device or in one app. Uh, while in others, they face unique challenges related to uh, infrastructure and digital literacy. In Mexico, we have kind of uh, the two issues. Uh, despite these variations, payment aggregators play a crucial role in, in catalyzing uh, a revolution in financial inclusivity uh, and convenience. Can we do the next one, please? Thanks. And so despite Mexico's substantial number of, of, of debit and credit cards, Mexico has somewhere around 160 million debit cards and around 30 million credit cards. So if compared with other economies of the size, uh, it seems like fairly uh, healthy numbers. However, uh, the country uh, faces challenges in adopting digital payments. So a lot of people have credit and debit cards, but they don't have enough places to use them and, and thus they don't, they, don't, they don't actually transact with them. Uh, in 2012, uh, only around 500,000 businesses in Mexico accepted digital payments, uh, revealing a notable gap in digital infrastructure. Um, however, the tide began to shift with the uh, 2014 financial reform, which aimed to modernize the financial system in Mexico, enhance competition and promote uh, financial inclusion. Uh, the reform aimed to address issues uh, such as, obviously, the, the gap in payments, uh, limited credit access, uh, and high banking fees. Uh, fostering a more dynamic and inclusive uh, financial ecosystem. Uh, measures were introduced to encourage innovation, including enabling uh, uh, payment aggregators like Clip, PayPal, Mercado Pago, and others, uh, while aiming to align uh, Mexico's financial regulations with global standards. Uh, that was the, the initial goal. We're still working towards that, but that, that was the, the alleged goal of the reform. Uh, it was driven by a vision to leverage technology and innovation for a more accessible and efficient uh, financial system benefiting all segments of the, the economy. As a result, the number of businesses accepting digital payments has surged, uh, now exceeding four and a half million uh, point of sale uh, uh, terminals, up from 500,000 just 10 years ago. Yet, with over 11 million businesses in Mexico, both formal and informal, the informal in economy in Mexico is huge. And that is part of the reason why the role of aggregators is, is so important. Around half of the economy is, is, is in the informal sector. Uh, so there remains ample opportunity to further digital payment uh, adoption. Um, embracing digital payments holds significant potential for, for driving financial inclusion uh, and, and economic empowerment. Yeah. Next one, please. So uh, payment aggregators in Mexico have uh, emerged as a dominant player in, in, in payment processing, um, gradually taking over the role of uh, increasing the size of the actual payment network. Um, taking from traditional banking acquirers. So, so aggregators are now the go-to choice for the majority of new businesses entering the payment network. Uh, our, our reach extends far and wide uh, with aggregators currently covering 93% uh, of the country's municipalities, including 200 of them uh, on which uh, only aggregators uh, serve these, uh, uh, these communities. Uh, moreover, aggregators play a, a, a pivotal role in facilitating transactions, supporting around 73% of Mexico's total 4.9 million active terminals. Uh, particularly in regions where social development lacks, aggregators exhibit a stronger presence, uh, boasting a broader uh, reach and more extensive distribution of point of sale terminals uh, compared to traditional banks. Uh, this trend uh, underscores the people. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, 
Yeah, so I notice on this graph, it's showing the, the point of sale terminals of banks, popular savings and credit entities has dropped at the last couple of, of 2020, 2021. Is that because of COVID causing it? Or is that because it was naturally going to drop anyway? And so is this a, a trend that's going to continue or is that is it going to reverse course? As you can see, the trend was already increasing before 2020. Uh, so, so it was already there. It obviously did accelerate the trend, uh, but it's it, it, it's maintaining its, its its current trajectory. So, as of now, payment aggregators, as I said, uh, we we affiliate we uh, uh, onboard to the payment network uh, two out of every three new merchants that that, that do so. Uh, so, the role of aggregators is obviously uh, more and more important. Uh, and we're I'm going to speak about this uh, a little bit further down. Uh, but we're addressing the the, uh, the unbanked uh, or previously unbanked uh, portion of the population that were not being uh, seen by banks just because of the, the the conversion process that was to actually have access to a point of sale device from a banking institution in Mexico. It was a process that took anywhere from two months up to nine months. We have seen cases where it took that long. Uh, of course, it required uh, contracts, uh, minimum fees, uh, penalties if they, if they were not uh, reached. Uh, so around 70% of all businesses in Mexico were not eligible for, for having access to a point of sale device. Um, so that, that, that came to be changed by payment aggregators. And now we see this trend uh, continuing to grow. Uh, and the, 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 the market share of, of, of businesses, of aggregators continuing to grow while the banks uh, are, are staying with the, 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 mer the merchants or the businesses that they already uh, address. Okay, so yeah, I can see that the aggregator uh, numbers are increasing and you're really providing services to companies that can't get it elsewhere. But it looks like you're starting to eat into the bank systems as well. And I was wondering if that's going to continue. Uh, I mean, it's it, of course, there's going to be more competition, but but just the size of the opportunity is so large with so, 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 so many businesses is still not... Uh, banked less than half of the adult population in Mexico yeah, is bank is financially included. Uh, less than half of all businesses have uh, access to payment solutions. So still, the untapped market is is really where it's at. But of course, uh, as as uh, the the value offer of payment aggregators evolves uh, and becomes more sophisticated, there's going to be more competition, of course, with the other institutions. But just the untapped market in Mexico is so large uh, that there's uh, plenty to go around for 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 all of us for now. Perfect. Uh, I, I don't know if I answered that with, that, with that your question, but... Uh, no, but I actually, I really like the answer. It's like you're, you, you don't care about the businesses that already have them with the banks because you're focusing on the ones that don't. And if you just happen to take their share as well, then that's great. They're not offering a better service. In fact, you're offering a far better service than they are currently. I like that. <laughs> and that's the key of payment aggregators. We have to have an above a best-in-class user experience, just because the, the the type of merchants that we're addressing are, are people who had no previous knowledge of the the, the financial sector of banking institutions. Uh, so the alternative is always to go back to cash. Cash works. They they know how it works. Uh, so if we don't have a best-in-class user experience, uh, most of these businesses are just going to turn back when it, whenever it's convenient for them. Yeah, but you, what yeah. you're also doing is you're making the banks start to offer a better service to their existing customers or they'll lose it. So even even though like you're making everybody do better, and that's really good. Uh, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're definitely trying to, 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 to raise the, the bar and, and to be able to address the, 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 the large on that market that we have here in Mexico. Uh, so uh, moving forward to the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, as I, I was saying, I was talking about the, the experience of, of, of card present transactions, um, which has grown considerably with, with aggregators. However, um, we play a role, a, a crucial role in meeting the diverse needs of, of all merchants, catering uh, both to card present and card not present transactions. Uh, for brick and mortar businesses, aggregators provide uh, point of sale solutions that enable them to accept all card payments. Uh, meanwhile, for, for on online merchants, aggregators offer a, a robust e-commerce platform that address the unique uh, technological and security challenges associated with uh, uh, with online transactions. E-commerce uh, presents a whole different ballgame uh, with constant technological advancements, 
uh, evolving security standards and threats uh, that require digital uh, uh, vigilant uh, attention. Um, while Mexico has historically lagged behind in the growth of and expansion of e-commerce, uh, recent years have witnessed accelerated progress in part because of aggregators. Between 2019 and 2022, uh, credit card usage in e-commerce surged by 75% and debit card usage increased by 50%, largely propelled by the, by the pandemic. Uh, shift towards uh, online shopping. This rapid growth uh, has slowed down in part, uh, but the trajectory remains positive, uh, with the International Monetary Fund uh, projecting a 33% expansion in the Mexican e-commerce market in the coming years. Uh, and this underscores the pivotal role that uh, payment aggregators uh, in facilitating the growth of e-commerce and driving the digital transformation of Mexico's economy. So still, uh, as you can see in the, in the graphs, in the one uh, to, to your right, uh, Mexico's spend uh, on, on e-commerce compared to its, its GDP is it's substantially lower than other uh, peers in the region. Uh, and, and with the opportunity uh, of growth that it still has, it's, it makes it a very attractive market and a, and a very important uh, aspect of the, of the payment system that we still need to address and continue to grow in. Uh, can we do the next one, please? Thanks. Uh, and this speaks a little bit about the, 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 the type of merchants that we're addressing. Uh, by facilitating uh, digital payments for a growing number of businesses, aggregators contribute to the widespread adoption of digital transactions um, throughout the economy. This in turn benefits larger merchants, uh, oddly speaking, often supported by banks who see increased digital transaction volumes. The, the resulting positive feedback loop strengthens the appeal of, of digital payments, fostering further adoption among businesses of all sizes. Uh, however, um, this means that aggregators in Mexico support just 10% of the transactions uh, and around 8% of the process volume in the market. Uh, on average, an aggregator terminal processes around 5,200 pesos and 11 transactions monthly, uh, while a banking terminal supports uh, around 140,000 pesos in transactions and around 230 transactions uh, a month. Um, while aggregators may currently hold a smaller market share in, in terms of transaction volume, their impact uh, resonates beyond these metrics driving a broader uh, transition towards digital commerce uh, in Mexico. Daniel, um, I just want to pause here because these are really significant numbers. I just want to, for us to double down. So the chart a couple slides before showed that aggregators have, I don't know what it was, 80% of the POS terminals in the market, but only 80% of processed volume. So that's significant, right? Lots of terminals out there, but not so much volume. Um, and then we compare uh, the, the volume from a traditional bank POS. Um, and I, I can see how this would be a challenge because, I mean, you know, long tail providers need volume, right, to be, to, to, to really succeed, to, to, to be profitable. Um, and you need extremely efficient pricing and, and, and efficient solutions. So I know we're going to get into the barriers, but I, I just wanted to call that out because we can already see, you know, a, a, an unbalanced market here. Yeah, and basically, is it? Uh, I'm sorry, Daniel. No, no, just a comment because it's uh, Lindsay comment are coming back to to Nick question before. Uh, basically, the banks were well positioning on large uh, department store, the WalMarts, the Costco's of the world were already positioned with credit cards from the bank acquiring system in the past, and the aggregators are helping us nowadays to expand the economy to the non traditional merchants and it's including a lot of new merchants into the business no but uh, still the banks are very significant in terms of the volume and transaction there yeah uh, absolutely what ruben says is is, is completely true uh, banks um, in many ways kind of neglected uh, the, the long tail part of the, the, the ecosystem in part because they they were most focused uh, on, on larger merchants where they can do some cross-selling uh loans credit uh, credit card debit cards whatever um uh, and smaller uh, and smaller businesses were just not not uh, prof profitable for them to 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 even go after them. So the, the story of aggregators in the last decade, of course, there was a, a huge technological change. Just 20 years ago, it wouldn't have been possible just because smartphone technology was not really readily available. Mexico has over 90 percent penetration of, of broadband, uh, so so it it, it had a, a really substantial telecommunications reform in 2013. So a, a lot of parts began to click, and then there was, of course, a, a huge uh, uh, fintech momentum 
beginning uh, before 2018, but really surged with the, the fintech law in 2018. Uh, a lot of VCs came in, uh, backing many companies uh, that began to go after these businesses that were not profitable for banks uh, and showing the, 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 the relevance that this sector still has. Uh, and of course, uh, by growing and by gaining volume, some companies like Lyft, like Metro like PayPal, have been able to, to be profitable in, in going after these merchants. Uh, but of course, uh, there are challenges with uh, sustained growth uh, continuity. Um, so we do uh, face the challenges that we're going to be uh, speaking uh, in the next slides. Um, can we go to the next one, please? Okay, and, and, and this is where we begin. And I know, I know um, this is pay, uh, Mexico's payment network system at a glance. I know you're familiar with the structure. I know you're familiar with the players. Um, it seems familiar, but Mexico's payment network uh, is characterized by a high degree of vertical integration. If you see the, 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 the graphics, many of the names repeat themselves in many uh, of, the, of the different uh, uh, players, uh, acquirers, issuers, uh, uh, clearing houses, uh, are all owned by incumbent banks, by the largest banks in the country. Um, and financial these financial institutions control multiple stages of the transactional process. Uh, uh, and, and this arrangement grants banks significant control and influence over the entire payment ecosystem. Uh, moreover, these uh, large banks in Mexico also hold control shares in, in the two uh, operating clearing houses. Uh, as of recently, uh, Visa and MasterCard began switching. Um, but broadly speaking, there are two, two large clearing houses in Mexico, which are owned and operated by the large, their largest eight banks in the country. Um, despite this centralized control, uh, the landscape is evolving uh, with emergence of fintech startups and payment aggregators, uh, challenging traditional banking structures and fostering uh, innovation. So balancing this vertical integration with the promotion of competition and innovation uh, remains a key consideration for, for shaping the future of the payment network system in Mexico. Can we do the next one, please? So yeah, the, the vertical integration means that, that rules and technical standards for the payment network are not set by, by the clearing houses and chosen by the acquirers, as it's done in, in many other countries, uh, or by regulators, uh, as it's also done in many countries, um, but rather rules and standards are set by consensus uh, among the, the incumbent players uh, and this has delayed the adoption of, of mass implementation of industry standards, such as rules for contactless payments, QR payments, uh, and fraud prevention tools like 3DS uh, 2.0 and others. Um, so, so a lot of, uh, of readily avail available technologies uh, that are, uh, are so in many countries in Latin America and other uh, places in the world uh, have failed to, to, to arrive to Mexico or properly uh, uh, deploy uh, because of this uh, impossibility to enforce or implement new standards and technologies. Next, please. Thanks. Uh, so COFESE, uh, COFESE is the Federal Economic Competition Commission, uh, which is an independent regulatory authority in Mexico, responsible for promoting and, and protecting competition in the economy, identified barriers to competition in the car payment processing uh, market. Uh, as soon uh, as back as in 2020, COPESE identified barriers uh, to competition uh, in, in the car payment uh, processing services. Uh, and as COPESE noted, these barriers contribute to excluding vulnerable groups and small uh, to medium-sized businesses from the financial system due to prohibitively high fees. Next one, please. Thanks. Um, following its investigation, COPESE suggested uh, regulatory reforms to enhance competition including altering the process of setting interchange fees, which, as I said, is, is defined by consensus within the banking association mostly, uh, regulating clearing houses, issuing new rules for regulating clearing houses, uh, and implementing measures to prevent collusion risks. Uh, originally, uh, COFESE had proposed a divestiture of banks, uh, bank ownership from the clearing houses, uh, but it later revised its recommendation to focus on imposing uh, corporate governance measures aimed at eliminating collusion and at anti-competitive practices. Um, particularly impactful uh, for aggregators, COFESI's rulings aim to reduce operational costs, uh, notably through revising how interchange fees are set uh, and fostering competition among cleaning houses, uh, ultimately leading to improved technological standards, as I mentioned, and rules for cat, pay uh, rooms, uh, rules for cat payment uh, networks. Uh, these standards and technology uh, could mitigate transactional risks for aggregators 
and offer a more efficient uh, payment experience for merchants and customers alike. Uh, Daniel, can question. we pause for the slide for a moment? Sure. I, I really want to break this down because I think this is really the crux of what we're talking about today. So the Confessi identified three barriers, right? So let, let's just break this down a little bit. The rules and card payment services are agreed upon by the incumbent participants of the system. So when we're talking about rules, are we talking about pricing primarily or what are the rules that they've identified are uh, a barrier here? No, when we talk about rules, it, 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 that we, we're talking about the, 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 the messages that are exchanged between the issuers, acquirers, and the clearing houses. We're talking about the, the technological standards. Uh, the, the pricing, uh, it, it addresses that in, in the way that interchange fees are set, which, as, as right. I said, are done so by consensus, and then they're informed to the regulators, to Banxico and to the, to the Banking Commission. Uh, but they, they they really haven't changed them or, or haven't uh, weighed in on, on them uh, in, in the last decade. So, so they do have a broad range to define uh, essential uh, 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 aspects of our, our operations, such as uh, the interchange fees, uh, which we do not pay directly to to, the, to our uh, acquirer, we pay a, a merchant uh, discount rate, and, and but it is obviously influenced by the interchange fee, which is charged to them by the issuer bank. Uh, but right. that that is, they, they do have a, a broad uh, authority to define the, the interchange fees. Okay, so you say that um, the barrier is that these rules are agreed upon by the incumbent participants, essentially banks, right? If we go back to that slide that showed all the players. So how would, in your opinion, or according to, even to, according to the Banjico and, and CMBV, how should these rules be established if it's not by the incumbent players? Or how is it done in other markets that would better promote competition? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great question. In, in most markets, uh, clearing houses set their own rules. Uh, and acquirers choose which uh, clearing house they choose to connect to. In Mexico, we have uh, two clearing houses, but they operate as, uh, as a joint uh, venture. Uh, basically, they have the same rules, they have the same standards. Uh, so everyone connecting to the payment network has to oblige with those rules. Uh, and that has been the problem, that, that technology that, as I said, is really, readily available in other places can, can uh, uh, come into the Mexican market because of the, the difficulty to enact new rules, to enact new standards uh, with these clearing houses that we currently have. So, so the proposed new structure is for, for uh, acquirers to be able to decide uh, to which clearing house they can choose and, and, and for the clearing houses to be able to define their own rules themselves and not by consensus by other market players uh, as it's done uh, right now. So, so that's yeah. beginning to happen uh, piece by piece. As I said, uh, MasterCard and Visa are already switching in Mexico. Uh, in the early stages, uh, but still regulation needs to be issued uh, that, that allows them to, to actually have their own rules uh, and not operate as a single uh, clearing house or as a single network as it currently happens. Okay, very clear, thank you. Um, and it says under the recommendations here, so the COFESE came out with recommendations to the reg to the Banjico and CMBV to issue regulation that ensures interoperability. Is that what you're speaking to of? Yeah, the, the next one breaking the, up the the legacy relationships and the and the switches being owned by the banks. Is that what that refers to specifically? Yeah, what we have right now is uh, perfect interoperability because there, there's just, there's just one network. Uh, but if we start to have uh, uh, other networks, they need to be able to communicate with one another. Uh, and for transactions to be seamless for, for the end users, uh, if they want to pay with a, a Visa card in a, in a business that is connected to the, 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 the MasterCard network, they need to be able to, to, to uh, operate uh, seamlessly. Um, mm -hmm. So for that, there needs to be new rules that dictate how, how they communicate and how that process happens, uh, because what we do have now is just one single network uh, with not the best technology, uh, but very clear interoperability. So we need to uh, keep the interoperability, but have independent networks that are able to bring uh, forward different technologies and have competition between them. Okay. And they've also recommended a limit or a cap on interchange fees. Uh, not quite a limit. Uh, uh, it, what what they regulate, what the competition authority said is that Banxico had delegated its, its authorities to, to regulate interchange fees. Uh, to market players, uh, as it did with the, with, uh, 
as I mentioned. Uh, so, so what they're saying is Banxico needs to retake those uh, regulatory uh, authorities that it has uh, and to actually enforce them uh, and to do so in a way that promotes competition, uh, creates uh, more players in the market uh, and a set of recommendations that COFESA issues. Uh, from what we know by Banxico, Banxico has not made any public statements regarding the, the recommendations, but privately they, they, they have stated that they will comply with the recommendations issued by by COFESA in the timeline that was presented by COFESA, which is around a year from when it was uh, issued, which was in, in okay. early September of last year. Okay, so the recommendation is that Banjico actually take control of, of determining interchange or, or placing a, a maximum on interchange. Did I understand you correctly? Correct. It, it doesn't uh, okay. to talk about maximums, but yeah, on how, how they are set, that they should have a more uh, active role in that. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Um, and okay, on the second one, on the second barrier, regulatory provisions that hinder the access of new entrants to the market. So can you talk to what are the specific regulatory provisions that are, act, you know, stopping new entrants? Yeah, and that is mostly speaking about clearing houses. Uh, what we have right now is that clearing houses need to be approved by the incumbent, the new clearing houses need to be approved by the incumbent clearing houses. So you can see how that would be a okay. That that's clearly a conflict of interest, right? <laughs> uh, so, they must be approved by the existing clearing houses. Yeah. Okay. So, got so it. for Visa and Mastercard to to begin operating as a clearing house in Mexico, it, it took them a, a very long time. It was a very burdensome process, uh, and of course they're they're still not able to operate as they do in other countries in other uh, jurisdictions. Uh, so so we're still waiting on, on Banxico and the Banking Commission to issue these new regulations uh, for how clearing houses connect to the network uh, and how to foster competition within uh, between clearing houses and in the payment network as a whole. Okay. And got it. Okay. Okay. And then the third one here, co-ownership of banks in clearing houses create structures that, that could facilitate coordinated behaviors. Okay. Perfect. I mean, we've seen throughout the rest of Latin America, <clears throat> the forced divestiture of banks from clearing houses this is a trend that we've seen starting in Brazil. I think you have a slide on that. Um, is that is that essentially what that is? Is this stated barrier pointing to that trend that we've seen in other regions? Yeah, in other uh, and Cofesa's initial recommendation in, in the preliminary report that they issued was for banks to actually divest from from the clearing houses that they owned. Okay, uh, that, that was watered down uh, when the, the final uh, resolution was issued by the uh, competition authority, uh, but. Uh, uh, the first two recommendations are, are, are that, recommendations, uh, and this third one is actually an obligation. It, it is, it, 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 they are compelled to comply with this. Uh, so, so they have to enact uh, basically corporate governance measures that ensure that there is no uh, um, wrongdoing uh, or, or lack of, com of, of competition uh, within the clearing houses that are still owned by the largest uh, seven banks in the country. Okay. Now I know that you know we all know that um, you know Visa announced the acquisition of Prosa, uh, but that transaction I think is still awaiting antitrust confirmation. It will probably take a little while to fully be approved. But how is that fitting in to these recommendations or this structure? Is, is that a move in the right direction in your opinion, or or is that more of the same players, more of business as usual? No, I, I absolutely not. I mean, it, it's definitely a shift. I mean, we still have to wait for the, the, the approval from both Banxico and the Competition Authority, uh, which, I, I mean, I, we, we know it's going to take probably the rest of this year uh, and into the beginning of the next one. Uh, but we see this as a, as a, as a net positive move. Um, of course, there, there's uh, there's a speculation about the, 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 the actual effects that we, we will feel. Uh, but just having multinational uh, global players uh, being drawn to to invest in the payment network in Mexico, uh, we see it as a very positive uh, uh, move. Okay, okay. Can you can you elaborate on that speculation that you just mentioned? Whether it will have what 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 impact it will finally have? Yeah, what we uh, what we obviously want to see in the end is, is having uh, clearing houses operate as they do in other countries, having the technology that we we know and see in other countries. Uh, here in Mexico, that is something that we're looking forward uh, and we hope to see from the, this transaction. Uh, we don't know the exact implications because, uh, 
of course, there's going to be still partial ownership of the other banks, uh, how it's still connected with uh, the, the, the incumbent players, uh, the rules that it still has. It's not clear how it's, how the, the shift and the ownership will change all of that. Uh, but in general, from what we know, it, it, we want to see the, the, the shifts and the, and the technology trends that we see in other places come to Mexico. And we see this as a way of that happening sooner. Okay, great. Um, and then my final question on this slide, thank you so much for you know indulging me, is you, you, you touched on it briefly, but what has been the response of Banjico to, to this? And do you, what is your opinion on if these changes will be implemented? I, obviously this is a very political issue. Um, do you see this moving quickly? Move, you know, are, are regulators, do they agree? Are they, do they have the will and, and, and the, the capabilities to move forward on this? What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, the, the regulators have voiced their, 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 their opinion. I'm very much intent to, to comply with the, the recommendations issued by COFESE. So in that, in that sense, uh, we, we do have some optimism going. Uh, the timing is not very clear. They said that they will comply with the, the, the time frame allowed by, by COFESE, which can be extended by some uh, months. Um, but over, overall, we do see a, a, positive, a, positive, a positive stance from the, uh, both uh, Banxico and the Banking uh, Commission uh, to move forward with these changes. The timing is a little bit iffy. As you know, we have a political uh, climate in Mexico going on. We have a presidential campaign uh, going on uh, on June 2nd, we have a presidential election. So a lot of moving parts for very uh, uh, important decisions to be take, uh, to be made. Of course, Banks Banxico is you know, an autonomous uh, central bank, uh, so it shouldn't be impacted open much by that. But still, the, the climate uh, may, may be tense, it may be more difficult for, for things to be enacted as quickly as we would like them to be. Um, but overall, we do see, see we have heard that the right uh, uh, comments, the right uh, hints by the regulators that they are going to move in the direction that COFESE uh, indicated. Okay, okay, great. Okay, great. So we have a couple questions. Um, Guillermo, hi Guillermo, is asking, um, Daniel, if you can, I don't know if you can see the question, you can read it yourself yes. in the, click on the chat. So how do you see the, the Red M initiative recently announced by the Bank Association playing out in promoting competition? I mean, we, we, we've learned about this initiative. We really uh, uh, still have a lot of doubts about it, have, have a lot of questions to be answered about, about how it would work. Uh, the proposal is that, as I said, many of the, the regulations that are issued uh, are, are done so within the, the, the banking association largely. Um, the decision uh, of uh, the setting of interchange fees uh, the decision of the contrato intercambio domestico, which are basically the rules of the of the both clearing houses have uh, the, the the Mexican payment network as it exists today, are issued by the, the bodies within the banking association. Um, so this is a way of of taking those uh, deliberative bodies that exist within the banking association outside and making it uh, autonomous. Uh, we know that the, that the regulator. Uh, likes this because uh, it gives them a figure that they can actually regulate uh, instead of just the ambiguous term of, of, of uh, participants of the network uh, uh, payment system. Um, but still, there are, there are a lot of doubts about, uh, going about how, how it would be financed, uh, what happens if all players uh, choose to take part in this new uh, uh, Redeme. Um, so still, of course, uh, lingering for, for me to give very much of, of an opinion beyond what I've just said. Uh, but it's definitely something that we're looking at. Uh, and it's a way that, 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 that the banks could be uh, hinting to, to, to address the, the concerns uh, about the corporate, corporate governance that Kofese uh, highlighted. So uh, it's, as I said, it's still early days on, on it, but uh, uh, definitely something that we're following up with very closely. So just to, to, to make sure I understood, Daniel, Red M is an initiative or a proposal to take to create a, an independent group, basically the decisions around all of these, the, the rules and interchange, et cetera, extract it from the banking association and have it be a separate group. Is that, did I understand correctly? Correct. So it, it would okay. have its and, own legal, uh, it would be incorporated legally, it would have it all, its own, okay. uh, yeah, structure and everything. Got it. And what does MA mean? Does anyone know what the MA stands for? I, I believe it's Mexico. 
Mexico. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right. And just real quick, um, I love this question. Uh, which are the main payment aggregators in Mexico? So for those okay. who are not as familiar, then can you just name off the, the top players? Yeah. I, I mean, some are, are, are regional players that, that we'll know that uh, Mercado Pago, uh, PayPal, of course, uh, and there's local players uh, like Clip, uh, which is uh, one of the largest uh, payment aggregators in the country. Uh, and and there, there are around 45, to, uh, between 45 to 50 payment aggregators. Uh, some, uh, some address very specific needs, like the need of, 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 of businesses uh, in, the, in the education industry, uh, businesses that, that address very specific uh, uh, sectors. Uh, and others are more broad uh, and try to reach a broader public. But uh, some specified in card present transaction, some do both card present, card not present, some extremely focused on e-commerce. Um, so it's it's a very active uh, ecosystem that we have uh, in the payment uh, the aggregator landscape. Perfect. And then we've got a couple of questions here from Gabriel and from Marco, which are touching on a similar thing. And I was waiting for this question to come up. Can you, Daniel, speak to the role of instant payments, Kodi, Demo, um, and how aggregators may or may not be incorporating these payment methods. I mean, you know, we're talking about the unbanked and informal market, and we see that those kind of low cost payment methods are usually in high demand um, compared to cards when we're talking about the informal market. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I can speak from the experience of, of, of Clip. Um, we aim to, to, to onboard every, uh, a payment uh, method that, that is available and that the public is, is calling for uh, within our platform. So, so merchants that, that on board with Clip are able to process, of course, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, uh, Dallas. Uh, so, so every every payment method that, that they can think of, we aim, aim to onboard it. Uh, with Kodi and, uh, and later Demo, uh, that demand hasn't been on the side of the merchants yet. Uh, there are still... Uh, uh, drives from from the central bank uh, to push uh, for, for for more adoption of of, of Kodi and, and as of late uh, more of Demo, uh, but still the, the demand is not quite there from the public. Uh, we're, we're still working with with Banxico, uh, uh, other partners to onboard uh, the, the the payment uh, uh, methods that, that that people are requiring from us. But as of late, it hasn't picked up enough uh, for us to, 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 to actually carry those, those uh, payment methods in our platform. And what about just SPAY generally, right? Um, Kodi and Demo are kind of projects that haven't necessarily scaled, but SPAY is used heavily um, and even for, for purchases or for you know, daily transactions. Do you have a vision on how SPAY might be incorporated into a, into a POS and, or into some type of aggregators system? For, for I mean, I mean, it already is an e-commerce, but how, can, yeah, can you just talk about Spay a little bit? Absolutely. I mean, Spay is uh, a groundbreaking uh, uh, technology that was introduced by the central bank 20 years ago now, uh, and, and it's still very much in use. We, we rely on it heavily for all of our transactions. That is the way that we pay our merchants. Uh, um, the, our value offer is that we pay within 24 hours of the payment being, being executed. And we deposit their funds either on our wallet that, that they have with us or uh, in, in a banking institution, in a bank account. And we're able to deposit uh, with that speed because uh, the reliance that we do have on SPAY. So SPAY is and will continue to be a very uh, centerpiece of the Mexican payment landscape for, for years to come. Mm -hmm. But you think more in the background, not necessarily for consumers paying directly to merchants? I mean, use cases are ever more so present. So, so we, we are adapting with the needs of our merchants and, and with what, what our merchants are, are looking for. Um, so yeah, obviously as we begin to get more technology, begin to get more case uses for, for payments uh, within the, 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 the ecosystem, uh, of course, uh, Kodi, Demo is the, are, are gonna begin to, to make more sense uh, in other verticals yeah. that we're trying and in other products that we're launching. Got it. Okay, so Daniel, I know you have a couple more slides. I have some more questions, but let, let's continue. Um, we, only, we have a just, we're almost running out of time. So I wanna make sure you get through your presentation here. Sure. Uh, uh, so yeah, uh, as we said, Mexico's case is not unique as competition agencies across Latin American countries have long been conducting uh, investigations in the payment method sector to, to identify barriers to competition. 
the focus on fostering competition in this sector has led to, to substantial growth in other markets uh, as well. Uh, by scrutinizing practices such as uh, interchange fee setting and ownership structures of clearing houses, competition agencies aim to create a, a more level playing field, uh, encourage innovation and, and lower costs for consumers and businesses. Uh, this approach aligns with broader efforts in the region to promote economic efficiency uh, and enhance consumer welfare uh, by dismantling uh, monopolistic structures and promoting fair competition in key sectors such as finance uh, and commerce. Uh, and this process, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, has been uh, going for at least the last 10 years. Brazil was one of the first countries to, to, to begin um, such uh, competition efforts. Uh, and the results are very clear. The, the electronic payment penetration from Colombia went from 16% in 2014 to, 20, uh, to, to 29% in 2021. Brazil from 26 to 52, Chile from 27 to 53. Uh, and Mexico, we went from 9 to around 26%. Uh, so, so a lot of growth, but still a far cry from what other countries have seen. And that's mainly because we, we began these uh, competition efforts uh, way, before, way, way after uh, many of these uh, peer countries in the region. Uh, can, can we go next one, please? And I think I'm almost done with this one. So, uh, so as we have seen, uh, Mexico faces common challenges uh, shared by other other countries in terms of the adoption of non-cash payments, including low bank account ownership, a substantial informal economy, and widespread informal employment. Uh, all contributing to a prevalent preference of uh, cash transactions. Uh, despite some progress, Mexico's bank account ownership rate it, it remains at less than 50% among, among Mexican adults, uh, which is significantly lower, not, not lower than other countries. Countries like uh, uh, Chile and Brazil have over 90% or to, close to close to 100% of bank account penetration. And despite some progress, Mexico's, uh, uh, sorry, particularly concerning uh, is the persistently low bank account ownership uh, among rural, less educated, and low income demographic. Uh, despite the emergence of payment providers, uh, structural barriers persist, hindering the entry of new players uh, and impeding uh, the development of quality service necessary for greater inclusion in the digital economy. Uh, factors such as high fraud levels, 2.3 times higher than uh, the Latin American average, and low approval ratios compared to the US and EU uh, underscore the challenging uh, challenges facing uh, Mexico's digital economy. Uh, these challenges really stem from the lack of competition uh, in the car payment network. Uh, and, and despite Mexico being the second largest economy in Latin America, it lags behind uh, in financial inclusion metrics with bank account penetration, electronic pay, uh, payment penetration of 26%, and pure point of sale devices uh, per million inhabitants compared to other regional counterparts like Brazil and Argentina. Uh, which indicate a lower adoption of electronic payments. Uh, next one, please. So, uh, I, Daniel, here, um, let's let's go back one, Sully. Um, I, break it down for us, right? You, it's clear that there's demand for um, payment aggregators, right? Just based on the number of POS terminals, and you guys, you know, t tend to have smaller, you know, dongles and and things that work with your smartphone, things that are just easier to to access. But there's still a challenge getting the volume. So what is that? Why is that in relation to what you've shared today? And can you ex describe, you know, if, if all of this, if all of these regulatory changes um, went in, uh, were implemented, right? And, and the, the Payment Aggregator Association kind of got what it wanted. How would that change daily life? for aggregators and their merchants? What new pricing would they get? What new products and solutions would they get? How would that change the, the status quo in Mexico today? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, and in short, it, it translates to, to sustain growth. If the changes that we're talking about actually do take place, uh, if the, the cost of uh, the acquiring cost of new businesses uh, can be reduced by, by uh, a different way of determining interchange fees, uh, by providing aggregators uh, access to, to more, more cost efficient acquiring methods uh, and interchange fees or merchant uh, discount rates, uh, uh, we would be able to, to, to sustain this growth and to actually address uh, this market that, that, that is still on tap. Uh, and alongside that, if we're able to gain access to technology that helps us uh, reduce fraud, uh, uh, make more efficient payments, uh, 
just overall better technology, and we will be able to to really do more cross selling of products to those new merchants that are being onboarded or would be onboarded, uh, and actually compounded that uh, volume of new merchants uh, and providing with new solutions that obviously are more uh, profitable for us, uh, but mm -hmm. that drive the wheels of, of the economy and just create more opportunities for everyone. So so, so really talking about sustained growth uh, and really driving the change that is needed uh, technology-wise, uh, uh, but more, more importantly, competition-wise. Okay. So just to get a little more specific here, what is a target MDR that aggregators would think is more competitive or more appealing to their client base? That, that, that is something that I would not be able to, to, to say here. And that is something that uh, we're obviously providing inputs and, and uh, giving our opinion to the regulators on, on how that should be determined. Uh, but as of now, that is something that I, I'm not comfortable saying uh, out loud here. Sure, sure. Is there a percentage reduction you're looking for? Or is there a basis points range? Just to make it a little bit more tangible. I mean, I you you look online and you see, you know, rates are at advertised at 3.5% up to 4.5%. Um, is there any, is there any range you can give us an idea about? I really wouldn't feel comfortable. Uh, what we're hoping for is to be able to continue to onboard uh, small businesses. As you said, the long, the long tail businesses uh, out there that are not being addressed. Uh, so something that will allow us to, 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 to still be competitive, go after those businesses and provide obviously a, a value offer that is uh, attractive enough for them. So so, yeah. so that is- that, And that, there's that a big the window to play with, right? Because you're getting, you know, alternative options. They're, they're not in huge demand yet, but, you know, at least at PCMI, we believe that they will start to be, right? As this trend just continues of, of wallets and, and low, other low cost, you know, bank A to A driven payment methods that are either zero or very low cost. So there is a big window. There's a lot of, you know, opportunity to move there in terms of pricing. Um, yeah, then sorry, my other question. It, it, sorry, yeah, go ahead. In, in that sense, I mean, talking about uh, the uh, discount rates for, for merchants, one of the problems that we have is that that aggregators uh, have to 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 affiliate uh, merchants under the, the MCC of, of payment aggregators, which is something that doesn't really happen in other countries. Uh, and that this can, that, that uh, interchange fee of, of aggregators is the highest in the market. Uh, so we were able to, okay. to, to access the, the natural merchant rate uh, of the business, say a, a pharmacy is onboarded as a pharmacy and thus have access to an interchange fee that is uh, uh, lower than the aggregator one, we would be able to go after a, a larger number of businesses and be much more uh, successful and profitable at it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Amazing. Um, and then my last question, we can go to the next slide just to, to start wrapping up. Um, you mentioned, you know, getting access to better technology and solutions. Can you provide any examples, you know, what kind of solutions or technologies that would be, would be more accessible to you now than, than they are now? Sure. Uh, uh, I mean, some of it, 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 it comes down to, to just the efficiency and, and the use cases for, for, for the users. Uh, so I mentioned contactless a couple of times, and if you travel throughout the region, you go to Argentina, you go to Brazil, you go to Guatemala, even maybe here in Mexico, and you're able to pay pretty much everywhere day-to-day -day transactions uh, through contactless. Uh, when you come to Mexico, that experience is very much hindered. Uh, and that is largely because uh, the, 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 the banks or, or, or the, the entities that are, are responsible for issuing the rules of the, of the payment network it just haven't gotten around to, to, to issuing uh, the, the, the rules that exist in other places as they exist in other places. So they have this tendency to tropicalize them and thus make them more less efficient. And in the case of the contactless, well, we, we see a very low adoption of, of contactless payments. Uh, please don't quote me on the, on the data, but uh, some, somewhere around 70% of all payments uh, in, in places like Argentina are done through contactless. Uh, while well, in Mexico, we have less than 5% of payments uh, done through contactless. So technology like NFC, like Tattoo Phone, uh, which haven't really made their way through the, uh, to the Mexican market, uh, are something that we would hope that would be able to come yeah. if there would be more competition between uh, clearing houses. 
and really critical to make card payments maintain their com 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 level of competition competitiveness with other types of payment methods. So I think that's a great point. Okay, so we're almost out of time. We do have more questions in the chat and I apologize, we're not gonna get to everyone, uh, but I do encourage you guys to reach out to Danielle on LinkedIn um, you know, directly to continue the conversation. Um, I know there's stuff about cross-border payments here, about CBDCs that we're probably not gonna get to today. Um, but I want to um, yeah, encourage you guys to reach out directly. And then yeah, you have, you have your conclusion slide here. What are the final takeaways you'd like the group to have today? Yeah, well, first, I really want to appreciate the opportunity. It was really an interesting conversation, really good questions from the audience. Uh, and yeah, just keep, keep tabs on Mexican uh, competition and Mexican payment system, ecosystem, because there's a lot of moving parts going around. Uh, so the next, uh, the, 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 the last 10 years were really uh, important and we really saw a huge growth uh, in the uptake of, of digital payments. Uh, we're right now at, at, at across, uh, at across the roads where uh, we have many advantages as, as, a, as an economy. As I said, it's the, the second largest economy in the region. Uh, of course, with, with, um, with nearshoring, uh, we have this uh, great opportunity coming our way. A lot of the discussion around nearshoring goes around uh, if we have the right infrastructure, if we have gas, if we have mm -hmm. water. But payment infrastructure is going to be just as uh, important. Uh, for, for Mexico to really take advantage of, 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 of the next years. Um, so I'm really excited, really optimistic about the, uh, the prospects. Uh, and I guess we'll see what's, what's in store for Mexico in the next uh, couple of months and years. Amazing. Well, thank you. I, I know you answered a lot of my questions that I have about the Mexican market and probably many others in the group here. And of course, there's, there's more uh, questions that we have um, that hopefully you guys can answer offline. So um, thank you so much, Daniel. If we go to the next slide, Sully, um, I just want to uh, really, again, very grateful for your time and for sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, reminder to the group, we will be back on June 3rd. So please bookmark that date. And I also just want to put it out there that if this was a topic that is of interest to you, um, that you'd like to learn more about, uh, we have done more research on the Mexican market in the past 18 months than ever before in the life of PCMI. So uh, we'd be happy to field your questions and, and have some of those discussions following today's chat. So please do reach out. Danielle, thank you once again. Thank you for everyone for joining and we will see you next month.